Today, we're going to tackle a very big emotion, and that is anxiety. And thankfully, fear is not as bad as we want to think it is. When we feel fear, it's really not a problem. It's thinking about fear that's the problem. And so let's get right into it. We're going to warm up with some animal videos. And the first video here shows a cat being taunted with a plant it seems and you can see the cat has made itself big to be scary um, and to defend its position but the cat is terrified you can see and the fur is bristling um, the whole body is in a tense position muscle tension lots of rigidity here we see a dog that is being tormented this time with a horn and uh, at first it's playing and seems to be okay but the noise uh, is having an effect on its nervous system and without even intending it it needs to go to the bathroom and that just demonstrates how autonomic uh, these fear reactions are the dog knows it shouldn't be going to the bathroom there but it has no choice that's you know one of the fear Responses is to void urine, to make the prey lighter, to escape the predator. Now we're in Africa, and a cheetah is being noticed by a herd of antelope, and you see that antelope perked up its ears and noticed the danger, and uh, there's a automatic threat response. It kind of tenses up, and there's fear, there's startle, and it quickly signals to the other animals that there's danger, and then the whole herd gets set off. So most of the herd will not have seen the cheetah. They are just relying on signals from their mates for safety and for danger. And so this really shows you what the signaling function is of fear. We can see when other people are scared and then we become scared. And when someone acts out of fear, we all tend to act out of fear. Animals generally don't get blocked in fear for a long time um, because they don't have thinking, which tends to keep us in fear. And they don't know about the future. And the future is something that causes us a lot of concern as humans. Zebras will graze right alongside lions and uh, they don't seem to mind it. Um, they can keep an eye on the lions and they you know, watch to see when they're becoming hungry and then, you know, then they might start to react, but they don't think ahead. They don't uh, get tied up like we do. And um, and that allows them to survive because they actually need to eat near lions often. You do see animals getting traumatized, said shelters, and then you will see anxiety and hypervigilance and trembling type behaviors. And uh, Pavlov's dogs actually became traumatized when he was doing his experiments. In 1924, there was a big flood and uh, his dogs had to swim in their cages until the water got almost near the top of the cages and then they had to be submerged to be removed. And after they were saved, the dogs had completely forgotten all of the conditioning that Pavlov had taught them. And so these dogs became traumatized and they had different temperaments. Dogs that previously liked him stopped liking him. They were in fact traumatized like humans can become. And so Long-term fear states uh, is what we think of as anxiety, and we'll get into the specific definition in a minute. What's important is that anxiety is blocked excitement. There's really little difference between excitement and anxiety. Anxiety is just when we don't allow our excitement. We resist it or we contract against it, and then it becomes anxiety as opposed to excitement or life force or vitality. So fear is a healthy, autonomic, fight-or-flight reaction to danger. And anxiety is long-term, diffuse, generalized fear about the possibility of something bad happening that is held in place by worry. And worry is a term for thinking, uh, looping, problem-solving, and worry keeps us out of the body, and then the fear stays in the body, and we're driven by the fear. Trauma involves fear conditioning, like Pavlov's dogs, one-time learning of an extreme nature, from past dangers, or simply the absence of a safe relational container. It can be less about the severity of what happened to you and more about if you had a relational space where you could truly process what happened. If not, then very small events can be very traumatizing. So 
the key here, the key idea is that survival energy is stored or bound in one part of the body that belongs throughout the body. So the anxiety is when we're holding on to energy that should be distributed and discharged throughout the body. And then fear and fear of fear eject us from the body into thinking. And so this is the key here. We don't like to feel fear and we start to become afraid of fear itself. And then we evacuate the body and then we enter dissociation, embracing. Because we've left the body, we don't even notice that we're tensing. That's what the body does when we're scared. And this signals back to the brain that we're not safe. And so it uh, perpetuates worry, which is thinking, which exaggerates our sense of not being safe, which amplifies the, the body's response. Without embodiment, fear overgeneralizes and becomes self-reinforcing. So um, when we're out of the body, fear can spiral or can amplify and there can be feedback loops and uh, our thoughts can just make the problem bigger and bigger and bigger over time. So the defensive cascade, you saw this with the impala or the cat. Um, startle is the first response. It's an instinct or reflex. And then we orient to the danger. That involves the head and the neck. We actually try to locate the danger. The orienting response and it disrupts us from what we were doing. And now the danger has become a priority. And then we go through a cascade of options. The first one is, can we use engagement? Can we look for safety amongst our peers? There's a famous experiment where a group of people were working and it was a staged experiment and a fire alarm went off and most of the people in the room were actors. They did not leave their seats. And so the people who uh, were participants in the study stayed in their seats as well. And they started uh, transmitting smoke into the room and they made it clearly uh, seem like a fire situation. And the actors continued to act like nothing was wrong. And participants stayed there in the room for a very long time before they acted because they were taking the cue of safety from the people around them. And so that's the first thing we use is social engagement. Are the people around us scared? Then if social engagement fails, we're going to fight, first of all. Can we fight? Um, if not, then we try to get away. And if we can't do that, then we collapse or we get frozen in place. And that's just a defensive last resort. We go into this long-term shutdown until the situation becomes better and we can do something about it. What is the physiology of fear? Most of us are quite familiar with this and we each have our own patterning. Our, our body has its own way of communicating this. But the, the more you can become aware of all the signals that your body gives you, the more a way you can be of fear and the more you can do about it. So heart rate increasing. For most people, that's a very obvious thing. The chest pounds, you already hear the strength of the heart rate. There's fast, shallow breathing. And so your body's taking in a lot of oxygen, but it's mainly chest breathing. And then you have chest pain and constriction. The blood flows to arms and legs. That's why the heart's beating so fast in order for us to act. And they're sweating, especially around the palms. Our mouth goes dry because digestion is stopped. There's bracing and muscle tension um, until we know what to do with the energy to react to the danger. Our pupils dilate and our eyelids retract, so we're taking in more information. And there's tension around the eyes and dizziness, nausea, because the digestion has been impacted and voiding and defecating, or the urge to go to the bathroom is very common. Ringing in the ears, like tinnitus, and the ears tune for predators. And then we're less able to hear human voices and we're more able to hear high-pitched and low-pitched sounds, which is what, in the evolutionary context, signal danger. And our voice becomes monotonous, and that drone-like voice signals that we're fearful. So the skin, especially in the face, goes cold and pale, and that's because the blood is going to the muscles and our impulse control diminishes. So we're more likely to act out in ways that uh, are not in our best interest in the long term. And our memory goes offline. That's both to store new memories and to access old memories. And then we dissociate and we can have depersonalization and derealization. Depersonalization is when you don't feel like yourself. Right? So you don't feel real. Derealization is when the environment around you feels like a dream and it doesn't feel real. They're 
closely related. So there's this fear and worry feedback loop. Fear is the feeling that we have in the body and worry is the thinking that it elicits. And so if we start at the bottom there, you know, something happens, so we're triggered, we uh, experience some raw emotion and there's a wave of energy that comes through. And then if we don't stay with the wave of energy, which is what usually happens, people get ejected from that experience and they go into thinking. And then when they're in thinking, it's compulsive, it's fear-based, but they're not feeling the fear, they're just thinking on the fear, and it tends to be problem-solving. What am I going to do about this? What does it mean? But the thoughts tend to loop in repetitive patterns. So the thinking is not productive thinking. And then the more you worry, the more it creates fear in the body, and then that uh, creates more worry. So it starts a spiral, and the thinking becomes less and less productive, and less and less adaptive. How to work with fear. So orienting is something we can actually do consciously and voluntarily, and it sends our unconscious a message of safety. So if you've done somatic work, you may have had the practitioner ask you to orient around your room and look for round objects or a objects of a certain color or parallel lines um, or count things. These are activities that get us to use our head and neck and to really take in the room around us. And they also engage cognition. They ground you in the space. So that you take in that you're in a safe place. When we go into the mind, we actually lose touch with the fact that we're in a safe place. So you can voluntarily gain safety by doing that. The main thing with fear is that we want to approach the feeling of fear and not go into avoidance, into thinking. And so we move from approach to avoidance. It's like facing the dragon. As you face the dragon, the dragon becomes smaller and more manageable. As you run from the dragon, the dragon becomes bigger and more threatening. Anxiety is just energy, so it takes away the problem element. Anxiety is just your natural life force energy, survival energy. And you can feel into your anxiety in a positive way where you experience it as oh, there is my body's energy, and what is it up to? What does it want to do? Where can it get to? And the more that you can embrace that idea of anxiety as energy, the more your fear becomes something that you can work with, and it's not something that you're running from. And then sympathetic energy has this characteristic wave pattern. Nothing lasts forever. Panic attacks typically last 30 seconds. Even though it may feel like it's going to last forever, there really is a wave and so learning to stay with the wave for enough time to get to the down slope and to experience discharges is the key and when we don't resist anxiety through bracing and going into the mind and trying to distract ourselves and we simply feel the experience of fear then uh, we can ride the wave and the wave actually clears and our body shifts into a new place because we've listened to the signal that the body is trying to give us, the signal of danger. It's like a check engine light. We're going to the mechanic and we're examining things and then the check engine light gets switched off. If we ignore the check engine light, then the check engine light is just on all the time. And so anxiety is a call into the body and if you already listen to that call, then your body shifts. And as we feel into our anxiety and we ride the wave and it goes up, the more awareness we bring to it, the more we enable the parasympathetic response, which is the counter inhibitory circuitry that brings down arousal and brings in restorative and rest functions and relaxation. And so we actually have to feel our fear and our anxiety in order to bring in the natural mechanisms that allow us to move into relaxation. We can't try and bypass that by thinking of relaxing things, we actually have to feel the fear that we're feeling in order to get to the relaxation. That said, resourcing and guided imagery can have their place in helping to bring in parasympathetic on its own, but feeling the fear is usually more important when you're experiencing fear than trying to bring in guided imagery or something else. And then discharges. We've talked in other places about discharges, but basically allowing the anxious energy that's stuck in one part of your body, allowing your body to soften so that that energy can make it through to the rest of the body, and then your body will actually have a, a way of discharging that energy. Normally, temperature is involved. You feel a warm flush. Your hands and your feet become warm. In Chinese medicine, they talk about qi pooling, 
on the hands and the feet. And the energy is basically moving from core to periphery. And when it gets to the end of your body, there's a kind of release of energy in heat. And so that's the classic discharge. You also have trembling, shaking, cramping, yawning, all kinds of different releases. If you stay with the wave long enough, eventually the body has to let go of that energy somewhere. So if you track it and you start to learn where your body discharges or releases energy, then you can start to support that more and more. And then your wave can clear more and more. And you can come back to baseline and you can slowly lower the amount of accumulated stress that's in your nervous system. Over time, as you accept it more and more, your energy becomes your vitality or your life force. And it's not something you're blocking or working against. And then the energy is simply your vitality or uh, your sense of aliveness. Somatic experiencing talks about diaphragms. They're actually not technically diaphragms, only the respiratory diaphragm is. But there are these structures in the body which are segmentation or horizontal structures that are perpendicular to the flow of energy and fluid in the body. And so we can contract these effectively bowls and domes and we can then contain energy in a certain part of the body. And when we do that, um, there's normally tension on either side of the area that we're contracting. So the diaphragms or balls and domes will communicate with each other and you get tension patterns where one area responds to tension in another area. And so these are important aspects of the body when it comes to relaxation. This is where we actually block energy and this is how we contain energy in the body. And so just to run through them, the dome of the skull, and that's where a lot of discharge happens, getting your hair cut when you're deeply relaxed and your hair might feel on end, energy is dissipating through the dome of the skull. The tentorial membrane, that's a membrane that runs behind the eyes and is just another kind of horizontal structure throughout the skull. And then the cranial base and the jaw, there's a girdle under the jaw, and that's a place where we can hold tension in the throat and the jaw. Then uh, we have the thoracic outlet or the shoulder girdle, and that's effectively the top of the lungs. Next one is the respiratory diaphragm, and you see here how it wraps the organs. So when we breathe, it actually pushes the organs down, and uh, your respiratory diaphragm could be more or less relaxed. And when it's tense, it's actually tensing the organs. And the organs have smooth muscle around them, and so they respond to tension in the diaphragm. Below, responding to the respiratory diaphragm is the pelvic floor. And so the pelvic floor is a place where tension is extremely common. And if you're not breathing into your belly, often there's tension in both the respiratory diaphragm and the pelvic floor. And then lastly, just energetically, the soles of the feet and the palms of the hands are very important surfaces where energy discharges, and so they're included. And because they relate, as you start to relax in one area, that'll have a laddering effect into another part of the body. That can be a good reason to loosen the jaw and to allow your whole face to relax because that can have a laddering effect through the rest of the diaphragms. Perhaps the pelvic floor or the throat. And as the diaphragms soften, there's more communication, more information flow between the segments, and energy can actually make it all the way to the end of your system. It doesn't get trapped. So I'm going to bring back this idea here of self-regulation, and here's a definition. When the sympathetic and parasympathetic systems are coordinating reciprocally to bring homeostasis or the appropriate energy level to the situation without needing any outside input. That's why it's self-regulation. And so the idea here is that your sympathetic and parasympathetic systems are properly tied together. Now we're going to look at a few charts, what regulation looks like and then what dysregulation looks like. In regulation, we have your sympathetic nervous cycle going through oscillations within the window of tolerance. And then you have parasympathetic system is tying together with the sympathetic and helping to bring down the sympathetic when it's high. So you have that nicely tied together sympathetic and parasympathetic, and that's what regulation looks like. In freeze, where we have both systems stuck on, what happens is sympathetic goes up due to some threat that happens, and then 
the sympathetic is not able to come down. And the reason for that is that the parasympathetic starts out inversely correlated. So that's how you would expect. But a certain level of threat is reached where it's too much for us and the system goes into shutdown. And so the parasympathetic has this way of shutting down where it goes on at the same time as sympathetic without bringing sympathetic down. So then you have both the sympathetic and the parasympathetic operating together and you're frozen in place, experiencing a high level of distress or fight or flight and you're stuck. And so that's freeze. And then we'll do stuck on next. So in stuck on, what happens is your normal sympathetic curve goes on there, but it can't come down as far. It comes down a little, but it doesn't come all the way down to baseline where it started. And the reason is that the parasympathetic is lower than it should be, and it responds a little bit. And so here, when the parasympathetic should be bringing back, the sympathetic down to baseline, but the parasympathetic system is not firing enough. And so you have a situation where the red line, the sympathetic isn't adjusting downward enough because the parasympathetic system is not coming online properly. And that's when you have very low vagal tone. You don't have the parasympathetic system properly functioning. And so that's when you accumulate stress and then the stress is held in the system and you are in stuck on. And then if you do that enough, what eventually starts to happen is that over time, uh, everything just goes down and down. And that's because you're kind of in a case where there's not enough motivation, there's not enough energy in the system and you're stuck. And so the organism starts to go into a survival mode or collapse. And then that's stuck off. And you can think of bipolar as oscillating between stuck on and collapsing into a stuck off position and going through a series of back and forth between those two. The charts here are regulated, sympathetic ties together with parasympathetic. Frozen, both parasympathetic and sympathetic get stuck on at the same time. Stuck on is where sympathetic goes up and then it isn't able to come down enough because parasympathetic doesn't come back enough. And then stuck off over time, you get a collapse because the energy drains out of the system. Now we're going to talk about energy wells, which is an idea developed by Peter Levine. What happens as we release bound survival energy, we get into deeper energy wells in our system. We release energy. It becomes available to us. So this chart now is showing the parasympathetic and the sympathetic side by side. And the y-axis is activation. So similar to the other charts, but now we've divided them in half. And if we start here, this is where someone might come to session completely contracted and frozen and stuck and shut down. And their system has no energy anymore and they're trapped in this very low range. And so they're highly activated, but none of that energy is available for them. And what we do in session is we provide a gentle stimulation or activation that actually moves them up the activation curve. So they're getting more activated on the sympathetic side and then what happens is we tip the system to trigger the parasympathetic. And so that brings us back here. And now, um, so we've gone from sympathetic, you know, the person gets more activated, more roused, but then that helps the parasympathetic to kick in. And then that brings us up there. And then we come back and we come to rest one energy well deeper. So what we've done there is by going back and forward, by stimulating the system and then allowing the natural response to come, which brings us back into rest and restoration, we drop down an energy well. So we've released a little bit of energy in the system. And if we do that again, we stimulate until we get above the point where the parasympathetic needs to come in. And then that brings us down to the next energy well. And in a session, we might do um, maybe depending on the person's system between one and five energy well drops. But as the system progresses, the person becomes more relaxed. There's less and less activation and more of that energy is available for them. It's not trapped in contraction and highly activated, highly shut down state. Then the final point is if we push the system too far, if we do one too many activations and we then hit overwhelm or threshold, 
we stimulate the person's system too much and we get over the hump here, but it's too much for that person. So when they come down the other side and there's the parasympathetic response, it's not enough to contain what's just happened. And then they snap back and we get back to the starting position. So if we simulate too much our system, if we try to stretch the window of tolerance too much, we snap back to an earlier level where the energy is once again trapped. So that's why we don't want to drop too many energy wells. Sometimes just one or two is sufficient. And then the person needs time to rest and to adjust to that shift in the system. I'm going to include a slide on resistance here because resistance often involves fear and the fear of change. Our old patterns die hard and our guardians fear change and often uh, will experience some kind of resistance to the work or a feeling of slowness or dullness or anger or we stop coming to sessions or we stop going to yoga. There's some kind of energy that's working against healing. And uh, we often go to thinking and have rationalizations for it. This is not me or it's fake or I'm wasting time. This won't work for me. I'm in the wrong place. And uh, often that happens right before you're at an inflection point where the system would change. Sometimes it's known as an extinction burst. The old pattern wants to reassert itself in order not to lose its grip on the system. And really, it's a guardian that's not wanting to lose power. And so uh, we can think of resistance as a guardian acting to prevent change. And guardians operate out of fear. And so our fear system ejects us from the work. A few quotes, Carl Jung said, what you resist not only persists, but will grow in size. If we're resisting our resistance itself, it's only going to grow bigger if we try to ignore the fact that we're resisting the process in some way. And Dan Siegel said, if you can name it, you can tame it. So the idea of becoming aware of your resistance or whatever's going on and putting a label on it and even more helpfully naming it for other people and expressing it. And then the energy system of the resistance loses a lot of power once it's been brought to the surface like that. It's become workable. Now the quote, name it, notice it, neutralize it and move forward, become aware of what's happening, notice it, deepen your awareness of it. And then often that's enough to neutralize it, just becoming aware of it. But you can also do intentional top-down strategies like breathing or doing something to disrupt your energy or your, your thinking and then moving forward. And so we've identified what's going on, but we're not letting it stop us. And maybe the best idea is Tara Brock's idea of radical acceptance. And in this case, that's of your resistance that you accept okay, a big part of me is finding this hard. A big part of me doesn't want to show up anymore. A big part of me doesn't like this new arrangement. And then you've brought that part of you to the table. And if you truly accept it, then you can find a solution working together. It's when you try to fight it that the part becomes more and more rebellious and resistant. It's not easy to change. And uh, we're stretching our window of tolerance. That means we're experiencing discomfort or pain. We're actually having to uh, lean into something uncomfortable in order to change. And that can be helpful to give up the idea that it should be easy or effortless or downhill. And if we name what's happening and uh, we think of it as I'm in the right place, this is not a problem. I can experience pain. Now that I know what's happening, I can lean into it. It's not a problem. And we need the support and encouragement of others. Healing is a very difficult thing to do by yourself. And the more you can surface what's happening and name it and express it with other people, the more it loses its power. So beware of the privatization of the heart, that we can't actually face our resistance alone. Seeing our problems reflected in others can be instrumental in dealing with them ourselves. And then... A very important idea is that we can learn to move forward in touch with our fear. So we don't have to conquer our fear. We just have to notice it. And then if we keep moving and we stay in touch with it, we give the fear a chance to process and the system can start to shift. But we don't need to avoid the world or stay stuck in order to deal with fear. In some ways, that's what fear wants to do to you. So 
moving can be a very good thing. 